good morning, um, at least from Brazil. Good afternoon, evening, or good night, depending on where you are in the world. Um, so my name is Brian Saunders. I'm delighted to be uh, the host today for the Journal of Physiology's uh, Virtual Journal Club, uh, organized by the Physiological Society. Um, I want to start by thanking the Physiological Society for this opportunity and also this interesting initiative. I uh, attended the last two sessions. Um, I thought they were both fantastic, really great, and I hope we can follow suit today um, while we discuss uh, today's paper about subcellular glycogen utilization and ex endurance exercise. Okay, so before we get going proper, I just wanted to take you through today's session outline. So we're already into the first part here of the introduction of the session, and I'll introduce the panelists. Um, thereafter, we'll have uh, an in-depth presentation of today's article. I hope you've all had uh, the opportunity to have a, a proper read of it, but the lead author will take us through it, or the main findings anyway. Um, after that, we'll have uh, a brief panel discussion, um, which will then be followed by questions and answers uh, between the audience and the panelists. Okay, now following this session, um, there'll also be a brief 30 minute uh, networking opportunity. So for those who are interested, um, there'll be a link that uh, Rosie will share um, throughout the session and at the end of the session. Um, so once this session is done, you can click on that link and it'll take us to um, another Zoom call in which everybody can uh, open their videos. Um, depending on the number of people that are, that are there, then we'll be separated into breakout rooms of sort of between five to six people, which, you know, it's just an opportunity to people to discuss today's um, journal club, discuss science, discuss anything you like, you know, it's just, just like networking at any kind of uh, conference. Okay, so just some housekeeping and some information about uh, the session. So for those of you who enjoy Twitter and want to um, mention the Journal Physiology Journal Club today, here's the hashtag. Um, also the accounts for the Physiological Society and the Journal of Physiology. Um, so if you have any questions that you think of throughout the session or that you already have, um, please, you, there should be um, an appropriate button in the um, Zoom webinar here. Um, so please feel free to ask any questions and as many questions as you like. Um, if you could, it would be lovely if you could include your affiliation, but those who prefer to send questions anon anonymously, um, there should also be an opportunity to do that as well. And please feel free to send throughout the session and then the last sort of 10 to 15 minutes, I'll go through those questions. There should also be uh, a button to upvote any questions that you think um, are really of interest, and those should appear at the top of my screen when I ask the um, panelists these questions. Also, just for information, uh, this session is being recorded. Um, it will be emailed within the week to everybody, so we, you can always go back and uh, rewatch. Um, and with this email, with the session link, there will also be a feedback survey, and it would be great if you could um, complete that as well. Uh, so before I start uh, telling you about uh, our panelists, uh, we'd like to know just a couple of things about the kind of the audience who are here today. So we've got a couple of poll questions. So Rosie, if you'd like to put the first poll question up there for people to um, answer. So this one's about what career stage you were at. So it'd be great to know sort of um, whether you're senior researcher, early career researcher, still a PhD student, um, undergraduate masters, or if we have some sort of non-science-based um, individuals here. So we'll just give this a few, uh, about another 10 seconds. I can see sort of the answers coming through already. So there we go. So, wow, pretty, pretty even split here. So nobody who's not in the uh, scientific um, arena, shall we say. So a fair share of undergraduates and masters, PhDs, early career researchers, and we've even got sort of um, a fifth uh, being senior researchers, which, which is great. Um, so I think we can already go to the, uh, the next uh, question here already. 
um, which is how important are carbohydrates for endurance exercise performance? What do you guys think? You know, this is quite, or can be quite a polemic topic and considering the uh, topic of conversation of, or of the article today, I think this is a, a really interesting one to, uh, to see, to get your opinions on. So I can already see that there's a, a huge tendency to one particular um, answer, but we'll let the last few, few answers filter through here. So at the minute, I hope that's uh, come up for you um, there right now. So uh, one person put don't know, but for the rest, 88% put very important and another 8% went with somewhat important. So that I think that, that shows you what side of, of the coin, uh, what kind of people we, or, or what kind of group we have here today. So that'd be, uh, that'd be interesting to hear your uh, questions as they, they come through today. So thank you very much for that. Um, so we know a little bit more about you. So I'd like to introduce a bit more about um, the three panelists here today. So our, our main panelist here is uh, Rasmus Jensen. Um, he's the principal author of the paper um, being dis discussed today. So at the minute, he's a PhD fellow, at the uh, Department of Sports Science. Um, oops, apologies here. I couldn't. Sports Science and Clinical Biomechanics at the University of Southern Denmark. Um, he also did a master's in sports science and health at the same university. And for those of you interested, he is currently looking for a postdoc position. So there you go, Rasmus, a, a shameless plug for you. So I'm sure you'll have plenty of time to sort of show your uh, experience as you uh, take us through your paper. And in his own words, he, he likes to take a sort of intricate integrative approach to research, looking at sort of single fiber and me me mechanisms um, to understand with the goal of understanding muscular function and exercise performance. So our other um, expert panelist today is Professor Bettina Mittendorfer. So she's actually on the editorial board of the Journal of Physiology. And she was actually the handling editor of the paper, which is one of the reasons why we invited her to um, take part here today. She is currently a professor of medicine at the Center for Human Nutrition at Washington University School of Medicine. And she has a vast experience in whole body protein and carbohydrate metabolism. And some of her main current research lines are um, around muscle protein metabolism with a goal to elucidate influences of sex hormones, male female genotype, and fiber composition on the muscle anabolic response to feeding and exercise. And finally, myself. So uh, again, my name is Brian Saunders. I'm uh, an early career researcher in the area of sport and exercise physiology. Uh, I'm part of the Applied Physiology and Nutrition Research Group at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Sao Paulo. So my broad interests are in nutrition and supplementation, um, looking at muscle metabolism and physiology and how they relate to exercise performance. I'm also an endurance exercise and carbohydrate enthusiast, which was Sort of one of many reasons uh, for choosing this article. Um, so that's your panel for the session. Um, before I hand over to Rasmus, I just wanted to go through one of the other reasons for um, choosing this paper. So here at the University of Sao Paulo, um, we're lucky enough to be able to include muscle biopsies in our studies. I say lucky for us, uh, maybe not so lucky for the volunteers, but as you can see here, you know, we don't make the volunteers do anything that we ourselves wouldn't do. Um, and to have the opportunity to get involved in research involving muscle biopsies was actually one of um, the primary reasons I came to Brazil uh, throughout my PhD in the UK. I worked on the effects of beta alanine supplementation for exercise performance, um, but I always felt there was a step missing because we couldn't perform uh, muscle carnosine measurements there. Um, and now we know that uh, muscle carnosine is not evenly distributed in uh, muscle with greater content found in type two versus type one muscle fibers. And so I was lucky enough to be involved in studies here where thanks to our um, quartz fiber fishbowl balance, we could separate and weigh 
individual muscle fibers and then quantify the muscle carnosine content relative to these individual muscle fibers using HPLC analysis. And we also have other ongoing studies led by my colleague, Dr. Ema Dolan, who identifies subcellular localization of muscle carnosine. Now, we've also begun recently to um, a study in which we're providing carbo um, cyclists with different carbohydrates during endurance exercise to determine their effects on performance and on glycogen sparing, uh, performing muscle biopsies pre and post exercise. Now this is being led by my master's stu uh, student, Nathan, who I hope is watching here. Um, and it was actually he who sent this paper through to me, which included you know, not only muscle glycogen, whole muscle analyses, but also single fiber and subcellular analysis. Now naturally, Nathan was wondering, you know, do we have to do this for our study? Uh, as mentioned, our group has some experience in this type of area, so we know that this can increase the complexity and amount of work required tenfold. Um, but rather than panic, I'd been offered the chance to um, host a journal club session here with a physiological society and was looking for an appropriate paper. So I thought the stars had aligned perfectly and hence my, my decision was made. So I'm personally looking, re uh, really looking forward to hearing Rasmus talk us through his paper. He and his group uh, clearly have a lot of experience in this area, as does uh, Professor Mittendorf. So I think I've said um, I don't want to take Rasmus's thunder because I think this session is about his work, not mine. So I'm going to turn you over to him now and he'll take you through uh, the main findings of his study. So Rasmus, if you'd like to take us away. Thank you, Brian, and thank you for the invitation and the great introduction. I'll just switch to, to my screen and then we'll give it a go. And to all of you attending, thank you. It's, it's an honor to be able to present this work. Um, so obviously I'm going to talk about this article uh, with the title Heterogeneity in Subcellular Muscle Glycogen Utilization During Exercise Impacts Endurance Capacity in Men. And we, before I start, I actually want to give you the take home message that it, it matters where in your muscle your glycogen is stored. That is the primary uh, message that, that you should get from, from this talk and also from the, from the article. And, and the inspiration for this study actually started with the, this paper in 1967 by Bengtsson Team's group in, in Sweden, um, where they gave different diets so diets containing different amounts of carbohydrates to to uh, their subjects to they were fairly well trained subjects and then they could see that they could they were able to cycle for longer time when they ingested large amounts of carbohydrates and that wasn't really new the new thing was that they were able to do the biopsies and then could they could relate glycogen content of the muscle to the working time um, and in my group we um, we look at glycogen uh, in a bit more detail so we distinguish between the different loca localizations of, of glycogen and we do that using transmission electron microscopy and i've just taken the, this image from um, from the paper and as you can see so this is this is a, a fiber here in the background and it has been enlarged here um, and you can see the sarcolemma running here and below the sarcolemma we have some mitochondria we have a lipid droplet and then we have the first myofibril here so this is actin and myosin there's a, a set band here and a set band there so that's the sarcomere uh, and all these black dots that's glycogen and glycogen is stored different places in the muscle not all not just uh, spread across evenly. Uh, so we distinguish between three pools. Uh, one up here between the sarcolemma and the first myofibril, that's the sub glycogen. And if you look at panel C, uh, you'll see, so again, a set disc and a set disc. So we have a sarcomere here and the, the, the dot within the, this sarcomere, within the myofibril, close to actin and myosin, that's what we call intermyofibular uh, glycogen. And then we have between the two myofibril, so we have one myofibril here and we have one down here and glycogen between here that's called inter myofibril glycogen and i will do my best 
to pronounce it so that you can distinguish between intra and inter my fibula uh, but bear with me I, I hope I hope you won't get too confused and then in a previous study uh, my group showed that the um, the amount of intramyofibrillar glycogen so the glycogen close to myosin and, and actin uh, correlates best with fatigue resistance so basically th this is endurance but this is an in vitro model so this was isolated whole muscles that they stimulated and then counted the number of stimulations before fatigue was dropped to a set point um, and they could basically see that the intramyofibrillar glycogen correlated better than uh, the intermyofibrillar glycogen. So that was kind of the background. So we wanted to repeat uh, more or less the, the study by Bearstrom, so the Saltine group, um, and then, then look at the localization of, of glycogen. So what we did was we had our subjects come in on a mixed diet, and then they exercised uh, on a bicycle, 75% of VO2 max until complete exhaustion. And then they went directly on a low carbohydrate diet. So they had very little carbohydrate uh, in this diet, uh, around 0.2 grams per day per kilo body weight. Then we did the test again, um, and then they went on to a high carbohydrate diet uh, where they received a, around eight grams of carbohydrate per day per kilo body mass, and then a final test in the end. And we took biopsies before each test, and also after each test. And then we took some intermittent biopsies also. So in the mixed test and the high test, we took a biopsy after one hour, and then each uh, consecutive 30 minutes after that, we put in a break. And after two hours of cycling on the high um, protocol, uh, we took a, a two hour biopsy. Uh, and then they just continued doing these blocks of 30 minutes, um, with cycling and then they had a five minute break and the breaks they were just to get i mean we tried to um we tried to reduce the mental fatigue as much as we could so the breaks were for that um and we didn't give them a break in the low um because we expected them to fatigue or, or be exhausted right here at around the 60 minute mark so we didn't want to interfere with that uh, exhaustion time by by giving them a break and then if we look at the, the total glycogen, so this is what they did in the original study in, in 67 and also what have been done many, many times and are still being done today, is that when you obtain a, a biopsy, you, you homogenate it, so homogenize it, so you kind of mix everything up um, and then you measure the average glycogen content in, in that sample. And when we did that, we could see that there was a huge reduction in, in the glycogen content with, with low carbohydrate in the diet. But there wasn't really much difference between mix and high. Um, we expected high, uh, the, the high diet to give higher glycogen concentrations, but we kind of also expected the mix to be a bit lower. So maybe these subjects already ingested quite large amounts of carbohydrates uh, even before entering the study. Um, we don't know exactly what they they ate. We just know that they so they they wrote their signature in in the same that they uh, habitually ingest a normal varied diet. Um, and then you can see that during exercise, glycogen, just as we expected, is reduced with time, and they end up more or less at the same level here. And you can also see that exercise time is heavily dependent on, on the diet and likely because of the glycogen content. So on, on the low diet, they could exercise for 69 minutes on average, 112 minutes on mix, and then 150 minutes on high. And then of course, one question emerges, what, why could you exercise for a longer time on high when the, uh, compared to mix when the initial glycogen level was the same? And the answer to that is likely uh, the, the distribution of glycogen. And I will come back to that in a minute, but let's, let's look at the uh, location dependent utilization of glycogen. So here we have type one virus and type two virus, and we have the 
intermyofibrillar glycogen. So that is the glycogen between the myofibrils, which is by far the largest pool. Uh, uh, usually we say around 80% and, and, and our subjects actually have a bit more than 80% of their glycogen stored in the intermyofibrillar uh, region. And if we focus on type 1 fibers initially, you can see that there's a very um, beautiful di differentiation between low, mix, and high uh, in, the, in the content of, of glycogen in this region. But the drop over time seems pretty uh, similar between diets. So, so the slopes of these curves are, curves are, are pretty, pretty much the same. Um, and then they end up in the, in the, around the same level. In the type two fibers, there's a drop in the beginning of the exercise or between rest and the first 60 minutes. Um, and then it stabilizes and doesn't go much further. So this is one of the, this is the reason I've chosen today not, not to talk too much about type two fibers because they're, we, we only see utilization in the first hour or so. If we look at the glycogen within the myofibril, so close to actin and myosin, the, the pattern in type one fibers is a bit different, or actually it's very different. So you still have this kind of the same thing going on in, in the low um, uh, trial, but if you look at, at mix and high, they start at the same point just as with the total glycogen, and then they utilize a lot in mix, but they don't really use in some myofibrillar glycogen in the first hour uh, on high, but then it drops. So it, it, it appears that you can somehow postpone your utilization of intermyofibrillar glycogen. Um, and then look with, if we look at the sub glycogen, so the glycogen just beneath the sarcolemma, you may get an explanation for the, this pattern up here with the intramyofibrillar glycogen. Because what we see here is that the slope is actually quite constant between the diets, except for the first hour on high. They utilize so much sub glycogen in the first hour of high, and then it's pretty much the same for the uh, remainder, remaining, uh, remainder of that test compared to the other tests. So there's, there seems to be some interaction going on between the intramyofibrillar and the sub and glycogen. Uh, and I will come back to that later. But if we look at, at the, the, the relative size of these pools, we see that because there's such a high utilization of the sub glycogen, the relative size of that pool uh, goes down. So that basically means that the percentages that of, of sub glycogen at rest is higher than it is uh, at fatigue or at exhaustion. For intermyofibrillar glycogen, it's more or less the same throughout exercise. It switches a bit, you can see that in the article, but it's more or less the same. Uh, and that also means that the relative size of the intermyofibrillar pool has to increase. So we utilize, even though this is the biggest pool and we utilize a lot of it, it's not as much as you would expect from the initial size of it. Now, if we go to what I consider the most uh, intriguing part of this study, the uh, predicted time to exhaustion, then this is basically the figure that I showed you in the beginning from the Saltine group. How much glycogen on average do you have in your muscle sample versus the time to fatigue? And we see a nice correlation, I would, I would say still, there's some variations, but it's, it's, it's a very nice correlation. Then after one hour, it switches a bit. So there's still a correlation here, but it's, it's a bit more messy. Um, and, and of course, we believe that that is again due to the, the subcellular distribution and the differences in the utilization. So let's look at that. So on top here, we have the intermyofibrillar glycogen before start. And you can see that this correlates very nicely, has high standardized uh, beta coefficients, high R squared values. The same goes with the uh, intermyofibrillar glycogen and the sub glycogen. There seems to be more variation here. So maybe at the beginning, uh, this pool is, well, it, at least it varies less. So the, the R squared value is, is uh, higher. Um, the, the Standardized beta, which I consider actually the most important in this, 
is very high in all three groups, but particularly in intermediate fibula and subsaclinal regions. But then after one hour, it drops dramatically in, uh, in the inter, when, when you talk about the inter myofibular glycogen. So it's more or less halved here. And for the subsaclinal region, it's, it's what's one third, one fourth down, but it actually increases or at least stays the same for the inter myofibular glycogen. And the variation here is almost doubled or well, the opposite, it's, it's half. So the R squared value is doubled. Uh, and this tells me that this pool here, the intramyofibular glycogen pool, is very, very important to uh, maintain if you want to have a high endurance. So you need to save that pool. And then, of course, we also put all three pools into the same uh, regression model. And what I would like to highlight here is that in when we do that then the pre-exercise biopsy so the rest in biopsy the intermyofibula and the subsaclinal region contributes to predict um, endurance time or time to exhaustion whereas the intermyofibula glycogen does not uh, does not have a significant p-value this could of course be related to power. We don't have that much power. So I'm not saying that it's not important, but it's certainly less important in determining the time to exhaustion than the intramyofibular and the subsaclinal glycogen. And then what happens after 60 minutes is at that point, it's only the intramyofibular glycogen that really matters in predicting time to exhaustion. And look at this standardized beta value. It's very, very high. I mean, above one is very high. And then one more thing I would like to highlight is that even though I said that I won't pay much attention to type two fibers, they are actually important in the beginning of exercise. So the glycogen level in your type two fibers in the beginning of exercise does contribute to your endurance capacity, but not after 60 minutes, which is probably because after 60 minutes, you don't utilize glycogen anymore. Um, and we believe that this is because in the initial phase of exercise, uh, there's a lot of, or there can be lactate buildup and, and you, you need the support of the type two fibers at this point. Um, but we are quite surprised actually that, that we couldn't see a, a glycogen utilization in, in later stages of, of exercise in type two fibers. All right. So to sum up the main findings, the, the subcellular glycogen pools are utilized heterogeneously, which means that the subset the cyclamal glycogen pool is, is particularly important in the early phase of exercise. And then at later stages, the intramyofibular glycogen uh, takes over. Um, so there's this kind of interaction between these two pools. Um, the type two fibers utilize glycogen only in the initial phase of exercise, um, which, or at least I think maybe I should have rephrased that. So they utilize more glycogen, uh, I won't say that they don't utilize glycogen in the later stages, but they certainly utilize more in the initial phase. And then the intramyofibular glycogen in your type two fibers is the best predictor of time to exhaustion. So if you can spare that for as long as possible, and of course, likely also if you can put as much in there uh, before you start your exercise, you will endure for longer. And then there was this, um, interaction between subcyclinal glycogen and intramyofibular glycogen that you can use subcyclinal glycogen to spare intramyofibular glycogen. I would, I would like to, to speculate a bit on, on that. We do that in the article and I'll just take you through the argument here. So usually what happens is that we have glucose in the capillary and it diffuses into the in interstitial space and then it's taken up via the GLUT4 um, transporters or the glucose transporters into over, oh, sorry, over the sarcolemma, but some of it also diffuses into the T-tubular system where it can also be taken up uh, by uh, GLUT4. And we know that the more glycogen you have, the less glucose uptake you have. So when we have supercompensated subsarcolemma glycogen here in this region, the uptake may go down. And when this goes down, then this concentration in the interstitium may be higher, which would allow a higher diffusion rate to the T-tubular system, which offers more glucose to the transporters down here. 
And then very recently, actually in this spring, it was shown that during exercise, the glute fold migrates to the tubular system. So you are able to up, take up more of this higher concentration of glucose in the tubular system. And when it's taken up over this membrane, which is basically the same as here, but, but it is localized in the T system instead, then it is taken up very close to the intramyofibular glycogen pool. So it, glucose here could be uh, uh, utilized immediately and that could spare glycogen maybe, but it, it's actually also possible that it could be synthesized to glycogen right here and then you utilize other glycogen particles in that region. And that kind of ends the story. The take home message now is that first of all, eat your carbs. I saw from the poll that most of you or all of you knew that already. And then try to store them close to mice in action. And the obvious answer is how do you do that? And I simply don't know yet. We, we have some hypotheses that we would like to follow, but we don't know yet. Thank you all for listening. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Rasmus. Really, uh, really good presentation. I really enjoyed that. I was sort of frantically scribbling lots of notes. So I'm sure I'll, I'll pester you with um, plenty more, more questions down the line. Um, in fact, I'll pester you um, with some questions now, but also just a, a, a reminder for anybody um, who does have a question um, to please uh, pop it into the Q&A um, box down at the bottom of your Zoom screen and we'll, uh, we'll try to answer those questions at some point. Um, so yeah, I think one of the really nice things about your study is that sort of it, it, it takes a study from 50 years ago and sort of contemporizes it, you know, obviously muscle biopsies were new at that time and so um, they did what they can, but now, now that sort of you guys have the techniques of looking at single fibers and sub-cell locations, I think it's, it's fantastic that you've taken that revolutionary study and sort of taken it a step further. Um, but I guess sort of, I think, I think, you know, the central question that's uh, coming in that, you know, uh, can you maybe sort of contextualize what your results mean for um, past studies that have quantified muscle glycogen, um, whole muscle glycogen only? And what does this mean for further studies? You know, like I said, looking at it from a, my own point of view, where we we're potentially looking at glycogen sparing and muscle biopsy. Should we um, be looking at single muscle fibers and subcell, or is there still room for only whole muscle analysis? So I think I, I, I'll, I have some noise issue with you, Brian. I think uh, I think ideally um, we sh we should uh, look into this detail about fiber type differences and also. Uh, location differences but it's very very time consuming uh, so i think the the answer to your question about what should we do in the future is uh, depends on the research question you're trying to answer and um i think one big step would be if we could distinguish between fiber types um and then i mean i would love if we could distinguish between locations all the time but if we start to to look at the fiber type that we are actually uh, using during whatever exercise we're doing, then that would be a leap uh, forward. But uh, I don't think we can do that other than the way we have done it. Uh, and it, it is very time consuming. It took us, so our combined efforts was approximately 40 weeks of whole, I mean, of full time work, 40 weeks. So that's a lot. That's very, very much. So, so if you if you need to if we need to know what role glycogen plays, then yes, we have to do it. But looking back on on previous studies, there, there are many studies that that have shown effects of or yeah correlations between glycogen and and, uh, and different exercise modes. Um, so, so you can show something. So you can take these initial steps, but there are also plenty of, of studies that have not been able to show uh, the relation between glycogen. And, and that then could be because there is no relation, but it could certainly also be that it's, so the, the signal to noise ratio is very low because we are looking at such a small portion of, of the glycogen pool that really matters. In this case, we have the 
uh, intermyel fibril glycogen pool, which consists, it's less than 10% of the glycogen. And then we are, we are basically only looking in type one fibers. So then we're down to 5%. So that, that 5% has to be very, very important to, to find it in the, in the homogenate. I think a good answer not to also dismiss the previous 50 years of no, no, research, no. I suppose. Um, well, I've got a few more questions here, but um, I think um, something of interest as well, um, just related sort of to, to the paper and, and to the quality of the research involved and potentially to bring Professor Mittendorfer in as a handling editor of the paper. Um, is perhaps if, if you could share as, as an editor on, on the, the journal of physiology, you know, I think the journal of physiology is quite a holy grail for, for many physiologists. <laughs> so, you know, what is it about this study? Um, but, you know, maybe you could give some tips to the audience as well um, that distinguished it, that made it of, of the level publishable in the journal of physiology. Yeah, I think, I mean, as you know, the Journal of Physiology has a long tradition of, especially in muscle physiology, I, I think this is really where it's probably best known. There's many areas, Journal of Physiology does not distinguish amongst any of the areas of physiology, but I think it has a very, very good reputation and strength of muscle physiology. I think one of the things this, this study is really, what we're looking for is, um, the pillars of everything, be the paper or a grant application, science in general, is novelty, rigor, right, in the uh, work to be done. And I think this met everything. I mean, it, I think it's nice, as um, was pointed out, that it really built on classical work and showed sort of the advancement of science, right, that this is an age-old question we all have. We knew something from before, and then you advance. Same thing to your question now. I was thinking, as you said, should we all be doing this? And it always seems daunting. You start out something and it's excruciatingly painful to get through and get the results and then and you think you can't do. But when you think about it, it's exactly this type of work that needs to be done to move science forward in general. And then these things become easier because more people hop onto it, inventions are made. So I think um, there isn't really a good example with this one because it's painstakingly tedious, right? Still, if anyone wants to do this, they have to be willing. I think you have to be willing to get a PhD because who else can do that, right? Work on a year on these um, muscles. But when you really think through, the thing that came into my mind now was like, think about where we are with gene expression assays, right? We didn't know anything about gene expression at all. I mean, I'm old enough to remember that it was in Northam Blot where we started, right? And then you had some idea. And it went on qPCR, and who does it nowadays? I mean, we move on to RNA seq. So I think, with that in mind, it's extremely important to do these types of studies to really move. It's a small piece, you know, in the whole puzzle. But I think this is how we move forward. And I wouldn't be surprised if we do this routinely, in let's say ten years from now, right? Because we've advanced, and we say it's no good to look at total glycogen anymore. And I just okay. add to that last comment, uh, we really need somebody uh, that has a very strong background in computer learning. Uh, I think that could move this type of, of uh, analysis forward uh, a lot. Uh, um, but there's, of course, a lot of validation that has to be done beforehand. But, but uh, I'm, I'm quite positive that, that eventually we could have a computer do a lot of what we have done. And I would think too, this is something that's not just interesting in terms of the basic physiology or exercise physiology. I think when you think of what glycogen does and the importance of glycogen in um, determining insulin stimulating glucose uptake, which is very, very important in the field of diabetes, I think this is really where this comes into play. I mean, you start out with a piece like that, you don't see the full implication, but I think this is sort of where the importance of an individual piece of work comes. Some of it is just elegant in itself. Some of it, it takes a little bigger picture to kind of see. And I think in terms of journals, um, there are senior people in there who have seen the field evolve over the years, right? That you get a feel of, this is really something that's a little bigger than the single paper study might digest and suggest, right? I think, I think those are really good answers. And I think sort of the, the fact that it's, you know, a study that's really advancing science, I think that sort of 
um, sets it apart. It's it's not just adding sort of a little piece to the puzzle. It's really taking a taking a step forward. So you know, fantastic, fantastic paper, Rasmus. Um, I am wary that sort of time is um, ticking a little here. So I'll um, take a few questions from uh, the audience here, if that's all right with um, with you. So Rasmus. Uh, Bettina, if you'd like to sort of, if either of you would like to answer any of these questions. Um, so the first one is that I have here is from Alan Bullock. So he said, wouldn't we expect as we proceed towards exhaustion, that utilization of type two fibers and larger motor units would actually increase rather than decrease as you found in your study? Absolutely. Well, that's, that's also what we expected. Uh, and so we have, I think we have a whole paragraph in, in the article discussing this because that is what we've, so we, we, it has been measured before by, by Golnik also in, with Binks and Um They estimated that, that at least it continues to utilize glycogen. Um, and, and if you look at EMG uh, studies, they've also shown increased um, uh, activation of, of larger neurons, motor, uh, motor neurons uh, at later stages. So I think traditionally glycogen utilization has been used as a kind of a marker of activation of single fibers. But I think in this kind of exercise that we have to be a bit hesitant because it's not necessarily utilized or oxidized completely. Some of it uh, leaves the, the, the fiber as lactate and that may be particularly true for type two fibers. So I think the large drop in the beginning could be due to a lot of lactate buildup uh, because we didn't warm up our subjects before. So they basically just got on the bike, exercised. Um, and, but I think, I think I, I will still argue that there's some indications also in, in, in the, old studies that they are more active or at least utilize more glycogen in the early part of exercise. And at least some of the Gunnick studies have shown that as well. So I don't necessarily think they're contrary to, to these studies, but they were definitely contrary to our expectation. Yes, thanks for that, Rasmus. Um, I think we've got a, still got time for a few more. I guess I'll leave it up to Rosie to tell me to uh, when to wrap things up. But um, so this one's from Mark Fell from Liverpool John Moores University that's popped up to the top here. It says, congratulations on the fantastic paper and great talk. And did you undertake any further measurements in regards to lipids and the time course of lipid use? We have that in the pipeline. So just stay tuned. Uh, it's not my work. I've still done the, so the exercise protocol and everything, but we have a brilliant uh, student that has been analyzing uh, the lipids, and I can say already that it's not related to endurance, but it's very, very interesting because it's not just, well, so with lipids, we usually uh, distinguish between two pools, but, and they act differently uh, over time. So it will come, we, we have analyzed the data, we're waiting for the manuscript to, to be ready. Okay, um, here's another one from uh, Aneta. So referring to glycogen storage for the high endurance based on the diet chosen in the study, was there a specific preference to what type of carbs was most valuable in terms of the metabolism and then direction for specific locations of their storage? So we, we didn't look into that, uh, but I think, so we're talking about three days on, a, on the same diet, I don't really think it matters what kind of carbohydrates you, you get because they are, most of it is, is presented to the muscle as glucose anyway, um, or all of it basically. Uh, so I, I don't think the type of, of carbohydrate you ingest um, matters when it comes to the localization in the muscle. But I know that, or I think I know that you can, uh, or you direct your fructose, fructose uh, more to the liver uh, and the glucose more systemically. But, um, but that doesn't have to do with the localization within the muscle. So just eat something and make sure that you, you have time to, to digest it. 
yeah, potentially further avenue for research, which, uh, you know, which uh, carbohydrates, if, if different carbohydrates sort of um, have different specific storage, lead to different specific storage locations in the muscle. I don't know if that there is scientific rationale for that or not, but potentially something of interest. Um, so looking here, um, Nordine from the University of Liverpool asks, would a diet including variable amounts of proteins and lipids also affect glycogen stores? Well, if you keep, <laughs> if you keep the energy intake the same, then yes, because then you consume less carbohydrates. I don't think if you just add additional fat and protein on top of let's say eight grams of carbohydrates per day per kilo body mass. I don't think that would change it much, but I actually don't know. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think I agree. If you're, if you're keeping it energy relative and if you're manipulating these other two, then you're manip also man indirectly manipulating carbohydrate stores. So I guess that would, in that respect, um, be to uh, manipulate glycogen stores. Um, and so as far as I can see, potentially the last question here. So from Alan Bullock, when you say early in exercise, do you mean in the first five minutes, um, while a steady state of O2 uptake is seen, i.e. down to O2 kinetics? Uh, so when I say early in exercise, uh, I, I mean within the first 60 minutes, because we measure after 60 minutes, but yes, I expect the first five or 10 minutes to be where this is most pronounced or, or maybe even happening uh, in general, but, but we didn't measure that. Uh, other studies have measured within the first, I can't remember, 14 minutes at least, uh, where they've, they've shown a, a rather high utilization in, of glycogen in the type two fibers. So, so they are definitely um, using glycogen very early on. Um, and then my guess is yes, then that is related to the oxygen um, delivery and and maybe also some of it comes from some anxiety or or um, whatever emotional status my subjects had when they started exercising. Um, I can tell you that they were at the same time excited and frightened by this protocol. <laughs> I... I don't see any more questions here, but I guess I'll, I'll just finish with a, with a quick question in that you said, obviously you took biopsies every 60 minutes. Do you yeah. think, do you think that affected the people thinking, Oh, if I cycle another hour, I've got another muscle biopsy. Maybe I'll just stop here. Do you, do you think it obviously maybe not as drastic as that, but do you think it could have influenced their, their, their thought process at all? I, see, I, I know a few of them used it as a goal. Uh, to say that I, I, I need to exercise long enough to give the number of biopsies that they need. But two of them didn't reach that goal. So, so there was two subjects that, that didn't give us an, a, a biopsy after two hours on high. Um, and they were, they were hard on them, themselves. They, they felt very bad for that. But that being said, it is also possible that, so when you reach that two hour goal, then the next goal is exhaustion. And then you don't, I mean, I, I'm not saying that we, we push them all as far as was possible. Uh, like some of them might have stopped before, but I actually asked them if I put you back. So after we did the final biopsy, uh, so around 15 minutes later or so, I asked them if I put you back on the bike now, how long could you exercise? And we had one exception. In all, so we had we did uh, three tests on eleven subjects, and one time one guy said twenty minutes. That was a surprise. The rest of the time they said probably only five minutes, maybe a bit more, or or sometimes less. And I actually had one that said I won't. <laughs> I simply won't get back on the bike. And 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 quite a few of them also said I would rather give you another biopsy than take another test. Yeah. It's, it, it's funny. We've got similar experiences with, say, repeated Wingate tests where people mm. say, I'll give you a biopsy, but I don't want to do another 30 seconds on the bike. <laughs> so, um, 
just quickly, just to wrap up, because one final question came in here from uh, Luana from the University of Sao Paulo. Um, could the training status or level of the volunteers influence carbohydrate storage? A nice one to finish on, I think. Yes, I think it could. It could. Um, we actually have quite a broad range in, in VO2, uh, but I, I don't, we didn't see a difference in the localization or at least not a difference in the endurance, but they were also exercising at 75% of VO2 max. So the, those in, in good shape uh, were exercising at a high intensity. So I think we regulated it that way. But, but we know from other studies, studies on elite athletes from our group, that, that the glycogen content can go higher and also the glycogen content in the intramifibrillar region can go higher. So I think training stages matters. And I also think that it makes sense that if it's important for your endurance to, to store as much in the intermyofibrillar region, or if that's not possible in the subcyclomer region, then that should, that's an obvious training effect. So I would be very surprised if you can't train this. Well, hopefully you'll, you'll provide us with some answers in the next, the next few years. Yeah, I hope so. Um, well, thanks very much um, to both. Uh, Rasmus and Bettina here. Um, just a, there was a question here uh, from Alan. Will recording be available? So yes, um, the recording of this will be sent out within the next week. Um, oh yes, Sanmi says, is there room for collaboration of any sort? Um, unfortunately, I think Rasmus can't stay for the networking session afterwards. But if you stay for the networking session, obviously, then you can get to know other people. So it's a great opportunity to potentially and collaborate with others. Um, so on that note, um, down in the chat um, box of this Zoom session, there should be a link. You should be able to see a link um, for the following um, Zoom session, which is, again, a networking session where everybody can open their cameras and everybody will be able to have a chat. If there's a lot of people, we'll break it out into smaller rooms. Um, but I suggest that you already click on this link now before you exit. Um, this webinar, because as soon as the webinar is over, um, then obviously there's no more chance to click on that link. So anybody interested in the networking session, approximately 30 minutes, um, but it will lead straight into this following this session now. Um, so I think that's it. Again, thank you very much, Rasmus. It was a, a pleasure to meet you and, and to hear about your, your fantastic paper. Uh, Professor Mittendorfer as well, a pleasure to meet you, and I'm really glad you could... Uh, Come here and provide us with some expertise on publishing in the Journal of Physiology. And uh, I'd like to say again, thank you to uh, the audience and to Rosie and to the Physiological Society for organizing these fantastic seminars. Okay, so anybody interested, have a click now, take us into the uh, networking session. Okay, thanks very thank much. You.